Welcome to the shooting show. This week, Byron follows Highland stalker Andy Malcolm and checks out the low ground for a roe deer himself. With the red rut in full swing, Byron joins Andy Malcolm on the hill taking a young client for his second stag. The weather is far from perfect and the early start is held back to allow the mist to clear a little. By mid-morning the tops are still obscured but Andy opts to head out and hope for the best. After an hour or so in the Land Rover, the weather does begin to clear below so the hunters set off on their quest for a stag. Already watching. As they drop down, the swirling mist makes life difficult. They don't want to bump into any beasts and spook the animals on this side of the valley. Just wide open to, to those beasts down there. Yeah. Um, we want to get all the way down there. I think there's there's virtually no chance that we'd even get to the burn without them seeing yeah. us. And the problem's going to be moving for deer, and you can see the sheep, the, the sheep don't help either. No. We've got plenty of them. The glen is alive with roaring stags. The atmosphere is electric. Again and again they locate stags, but this estate has a careful selection policy and they must find the right animal to take. He's not a stag with any great age about him. I'm just looking at sort of how, how much his points are sticking up in the air, but it's a really strong head. Yeah. Um, so definitely not the, the sort of beast we want to shoot. Um, we've got a lot of problems. He'll probably make a very good stag yet. You see this, this burn that goes up the hill with the trees in it? The burn. The burn. The stream, yeah. the stream that runs up the hill. To the left of that there's a big green patch. And up the left hand edge of that green patch, up you go up the heather and you find a tiny little outcrop of rock. Okay. And um, there's there's a group of deer around there. Just, just four or five finds. And uh, a stag with switch tops. And, uh, you serve us nicely, but the problem is we've got to A, we've got to get across this glen, in which case we'd be in full sight of them. Uh, and you've got deer to the left, quite a lot of deer to the left dotted about. If you went across the glen, committed yourself to work on that side, that's all fine and good. Um, but to sort of try and stalk across from one side to the other is uh, it's just not doable with that number of eyes, I'm trying to say. With so many deer on the ground, progress is slow. They have to carefully negotiate their way around each group to get further down the glen. Fortunately, at this time of year, the reds are preoccupied, which means you can get away with a bit more than you would later in the year. Nevertheless, they proceed with caution. Far below, Andy eventually spots a shootable stag. Keeping low to stay out of sight, they slip down the hillside and crawl into a suitable shooting position. Just below, a big old stag holds a large group of hinds, but on the periphery, Andy's mark mills about just out of suitable shooting range. We really need to get down that next ridge. Um, this, is, this is too far for down there. And we go down there, we could end up too close to the nearest ones. It looks like he's going to wander closer, but instead he decides to lie up in the long grass. Now it's a waiting game. He's beyond the main group of hinds. So what we have to do now is try and find a vantage point in amongst all this heather and we'll just wait for a, a good shot. Time is against them on this occasion. After almost two hours of waiting, they have to abandon the stalk and return to the Land Rover along with the Gilly and Garen who had been patiently waiting. Andy, we've had a, a really good day on the hill. Can you talk us through the, the day, how it went, 
and uh, why we don't have a stag back in the larder despite seeing loads of beasts and uh, you know, a couple of opportunities that are possibly would have arisen. Yeah, we, we were slightly unlucky today. We started off um, with thick mist right down to the bottom of the hills. Um, so we were delayed in getting out, we had to wait until the, the mist cleared. Uh, and on top of that, uh, the guest I had out had to catch a plane. Uh, so we had to be back at the, the lodge at half past four, which really limited us. Uh, we only had, uh, I think, four and a half hours in which to do the business. Um, we've got a great going rut on just now, uh, stags everywhere, uh, are, there was loads of roaring, uh, a bit of fighting, um, lots of activity, however uh, we've always had a very selective cull on this estate and coupled with that we're trying to establish our own stag herd, so there are a lot of uh, stags on my ground just now that are actually feeders. Deer that stags that we know are coming to our winter feed and these are the ones that we're wanting to hold on to because these are the ones that are going to encourage wild stags to stay on the place. So all this meant that we had to be very very selective about we went, what we went for. We eventually got into uh, a group of hinds being held by an enormous stag uh, and there were a lot of younger stags round about, younger smaller stags round about and in amongst them there was two that would shoot. Uh, both of which were on the far side of the group from us, which didn't help. And um, both were just out of range for the inexperienced shot that I had. We could have tried to have stalked closer, but unfortunately if we'd gone any further down the hill, there would have been a slight ridge which would have obscured these beasts from our shot. So really what we had to do is we had to sit tight, burning daylight, and hope that these stags would come up closer to, to the, the hinds. Uh, as it was, that didn't happen. The big stag was very dominant, he was keeping everything away and eventually when we were getting very short of time, I moved the hinds on, the hinds went round the, the slope a bit, the young stags came up, but unfortunately the, the one that we were after held back. If he'd come up with the other ones, we would have got the shot and as it was, while we waited, the big stag came, chased them all away and that was us out of time. They may not have any luck grassing a beast on the hill, but a day later, Byron heads out himself for a row in the final days of the buck season. I've only just arrived on the farm and I've already seen two road here um, on the dirt track on my way in. When I got to the end where I was going to park up, there was another three row about to come out into the woods and onto the rape field. They've now moved down and into a little bit of a dip. So I'm going to go around, the wind's in my favour, and then just slowly crawl over the edge. And hopefully I should see them at the bottom. It's a chance for a textbook stalk and spy routine and thankfully Byron has more luck than Andy with the Dern followers quickly coming into range. I thought that my plan had been scuppered when I had a look over the rise. The three row had moved on a lot further than I thought they would be. Normally they stop in this little bit of a dip. They were actually at the far end of the field and about to cross in front of the farmhouse. But a little bit of luck's been on our side and the farmer's dog has started to bark. They've turned round and they're actually walking back towards us now. So hopefully with any luck they're going to walk back up the same route they took and back into the forest. We'll just have to wait and see. Here they come. The way it kicked out backwards, I think I must have clipped the liver there. I just carried the kid off the farmer's crop. I didn't really want to growl it all over his new rape. Um, it's quite a, a reasonable shot. Just came in the bottom here, tucked right behind the uh, right behind the front leg. Well, we've got another two days left of the buck season, and this is indeed is a, a small kid buck. I wouldn't normally be shooting uh, 
a buck at this age. I like to leave them for a year or two so you can see exactly how they're going to turn out. However, on this particular farm, farmers have been grumbling a little bit about seeing a lot of roe deer. And in actual fact, there are more roe deer on the farm this year than there have been in previous years. And I think part of that is because of the large tracts of rape that have been planted. Uh, I mean, one particular group that he keeps on seeing is this doe and three kids that are not too far from the, the farmhouse. And those were the, the three that I saw this morning. I thought it might be a good idea to reduce that number by one. When I found them, uh, it was actually three buck kids, believe it or not. Uh, so I picked the buck kid with the smallest body uh, as a basis of selection, uh, as the best that I could do, just to try and bring the numbers down, keep the farmer on side. If you don't have the farmer on side, you'll lose your shooting, somebody else will get it. So sometimes you have to do things like this where you wouldn't normally um, shoot an animal. But anyway, good clean kill, uh, quite happy with this. Uh, doe season starts in a couple of days, so very much looking forward to that and then just getting the numbers uh, back in check and keeping the farmer happy again. And now that we've got the growler cut, you can see the damage that the bullet did. Um, today we're using 105 grain gecko ammunition. Um, like I said before, the entry wound was just tucked in beside the left shoulder. Uh, because of the angle that it was standing at, it exited just on the other side of the diaphragm. Uh, the stomach wasn't burst at all, but it did tra travel through the liver. Uh, so there isn't a hell of a lot of the liver left. You can see the, the damage of the, on the lungs here, where the bullet passed through, clearly expanding um, on its journey. Uh, because of where, where my shot travelled, it didn't actually go through the heart, so you can't see any damage on the heart there. Uh, but good amount of blood filling the lungs and travelling through the through the liver um, there isn't much liver left so the bullet doing exactly what it's supposed to do I've used the gecko ammunition before um, and the meat damage from them is, is very good actually uh, the 105 grains really does hit them hard um, but it's not travelling so fast that you end up with a, a lot of bloodshot meat so does the job and you still end up with plenty of meat to eat. Right, back to the larder. Byron there saving the day and now the shooting show news. This is the shooting show news. Gary Hyde has been found guilty of bypassing licensing laws in an international arms deal between Nigeria and China. Hyde, who was managing director of York Guns before his arrest in early 2011, was convicted of breaching the Trade in Goods Control Order 2003 and of hiding a million dollars worth of commission payments. He will be sentenced on the 23rd of this month. Release triggers could be banned in the UK after the CPSA announced it was launching a consultation on prohibiting their use. The CPSA board initially took a unilateral decision to ban them in an attempt to move into line with ISSF guidance. But the association then made a statement saying it had put the ban on hold in view of interest the decision has caused. The consultation is open until the 30th of November. Basque has unveiled its new chief executive to replace the outgoing John Swift. Richard Arley is the new man in the job and will start in the role in February of next year. Richard, who has a long career in the food and agricultural sector behind him, said he was looking forward to meeting and listening to Basque members. Meet the new shotgun licence application form. Same as the old application form, or at least not vastly different. Basque has revealed the result of its vote on two potential new designs for the form. It found that virtually three quarters of shooters preferred a conventional style form to the one that can be digitised using optical character recognition. Basque will now present its findings to the Home Office and the Association of Chief Police Officers. Antis have stepped up their campaign for a lead shot ban, with organisations joining forces in a media drive. The Wild Fowl and Wetlands Trust has seen groups such as the RSPB and RSPCA join its campaign and call on the Lead Ammunition Group to publish its final report before March next year. Last month, Food Standards Authority guidance on lead shot was leaked to the press before publication, leading shooting organisations to warn against exaggeration of the risks of eating lead shot game. And finally, shooters have the chance to win a personalised BSA PCP air rifle worth £500 in time for Christmas. 
All they need to do is fill in the entry form in the latest issue of Airgun Shooter magazine or download the entry form from airgun.tv. The winner gets to choose between a BSA Scorpion SE and an Ultra SE. The winner will be drawn on the 12th of December. That was the Shooting Show News. That's it for this week. Thanks for watching. We're out every Monday, 7.30pm UK time. This is The Shooting Show.